you write one essay about the Divine Comedy, and it's like popping up everywhere after that. Now shall you deal with me, O oh Prince, and all the powers of hell! Hey, you geeks! The Stormlight Archive is a true epic fantasy with multitudes of antagonists, from divine upper level forces of evil down to day to day foot soldiers. Near the top of this hierarchy, Sanderson gives us the unmade, eldritch type horrifying monsters that embody humanity's deepest fears and faults. I've seen many fan theories about the philosophical, psychological, literary, and even theological origins of these abominations, and thought I'd give my two cents in on the topic from the perspective of Dante's Divine Comedy, specifically The Inferno, where I found this particular gem of a quote. Oh, you who are conducted through this hell, he said to me, recall, if you can, for you, before I was unmade, were made. It's a sign. It's a sign that I have watched this movie too many times. Spoiler warning for all published books of the Stormlight Archive, and one line from the released prologue of Wind and Truth, but that's not till the end as we will be circling and diving downward into the depths of Dante's Inferno, starting first with Moloch at Antihel, and all the way down to Ba'edomishram with treachery. Number one, Antihel, Moloch. Fun fact, although Dante loves to brag about how profound he is for having three sets of nine in the Divine Comedy, Nine Circles of Hell, Nine Tears of Purgatory, and Nine Spheres of Heaven, a trinity of trinities of trinities, as it were. It's all very profound. Three shall be the number thou shalt count, and the number of the counting shall be three. Dante cheats, and the first place this is most evident is the Ante Room of Hell, which does not count as a circle. Before Dante reaches the infamous gates of hell, abandon hope all you who enter here, he makes the people who haven't entered. And this is the sound they make. Strange utterances, horrible pronouncements, accents of anger, words of suffering, and voices shrill and faint, and beating hands. These souls occupying the liminal space between life and death fill it with horrible pronouncements, which seems very in line with what Moloch seems to be doing in the Stormlight Archive, according to Hesus Mythica. Moloch was said to grant visions of the future at different times, but most commonly at the transition point between realms, when his soul was nearing the Tranquiline Halls. It's also interesting that Moloch seems to be derived from the Canaanite god of Moloch, who, according to Milton in Paradise Lost, is, of course, a demon from hell, and he comes first. First, Moloch, horrid king, be smeared with the blood of human sacrifice and parents' tears, their children's cries unheard that pass through fire to his grim idol. Milton is building off the biblical tales of Canaanite kings who would sacrifice their children to Moloch in order to secure the safety of their kingdom. This is also very similar to what Taravangian does with the diagram in the hopes of securing the safety of Carbron, because you really need another reason to just hate that guy. Nazis. I hate these guys. Because we are including this area, we're going to skip to the first proper circle of hell, that is, Limbo, because Dante says it's a rather nice place. It's got grass and lights. Just smell the grass, the dirt, just like I dreamed they'd be. So it don't seem to fit with any of the unmade, actually. Number two, Lust, Shemorash. 
We haven't seen a lot of Shemoresh on page yet. We do get this one quick note from Hesse's Mythica. Shemoresh, the Dust Mother, has some of the most varied lore surrounding her. The wealth of it makes sorting lines from truths extremely difficult. So forgive me as this seems to be a bit of a stretch as I lean more on her name association with the Moabite god Shamash. Shamash is, according to Milton, of course, another demon in hell. Next, Shamash, the obscene dread of Moab's son. To him, wanton rites which cost them woe, yet thence his lustful orgies he enlarged, even to that hill of scandal by the Grovet. So I'm giving Shamarish lust because Milton seems to think that Shamash is particularly lusty, though Milton is also basically a Puritan who thinks everything is particularly lusty. With their flaxen hair and tantalizing elbows, they're the very embodiment of sin. There's also general vibes of name association. Dust like ashes is the outcome of what happens like in Milton's Purgatorio when you burn lust with fire. Number three, gluttony. A shirt marn. A shirt marn, the heart of the rebel is the final of the three great mindless unmade. His gift to men is not prophecy or battle focus, but is lust for indulgence. In Oathbringer, we meet a Shirtmarn reigning over Polinar, which is much like Florence from Dante's day, a city doomed on the brink of disaster. As Sikao, the pig, warns Dante the Pilgrim in the Third Circle of Hell. What ends awaits the citizens of that divided city? Is any just man there? Tell me the reason. Why it has been assailed by so much schism? Two men are just, but no one listens to them. Three sparks that set on fire every heart are envy, pride, and avariciousness. In this dialogue, Dante brushes up against the idea of gluttony being something evil of the heart. I hear your heart beat to the beat of the drums. Which coincides nicely with what Milton has to say about Ashira, a Sumerian goddess who seems to be a namesake of Ashur Marn, Ashart, queen of heaven with crescent horns. Her temple on the offensive mountain built by the unctuous king whose heart, though large, beguiled by fair idolatresses fell to idols foul. Here we see the more images from the fall of Kolinar, an obnoxious temple built upon a mount and a large but unctuous heart. Number four, greed. Dai Gonarthus. Let me hurt no longer, let me no longer weep. Digo Narthus, the black fisher, holds my sorrow and consumes it, which seems to be something that an unmade would do. Though Hesse's Mythica does say, who is the ninth unmade? Is it truly Digo Narthus? If so, could their actions have actually caused the complete destruction of Aeonia? This epitaph is followed shortly by the interlude which introduces us to Aeonia where we see greed on display in force. What did I tell you, man? That new storm came from Aemia. Now it is gone and escaped, leaving the richards of its homeland to be plundered. Arr. Thus, Aemia, where Digarnarthus is known to have influence, seems to press men towards acts of greed, even to the point of destroying themselves in the process. You're meant to charge in, sword drawn, banner fight! That's what all the other knights did! Yeah, right before they burst in the flame! While the Sleepless may do a lot of the actual killing in Kaza and Risen's case, they don't claim power for creating the storm, so could that be the effect of the Unmade? Thus, I don't think it's a coincidence that Dante in the Circle of Greed for Inferno uses sailing imagery in addition to Virgil using language that modern audiences will associate with serpents and dragons, 
when telling off the guard of the circle of greed. Consume thyself within thine own rage. Not costless is this journey to the abyss. Thus it is willed on high, where Michael brought vengeance upon the proud adultery. Even as the sails inflicted by the wind involved together fall when snaps the mast, so fell the cruel monster to the earth. It's also not at all fishy that Big Onarthus has a fishy connotation since he seems to be named after the Sumerian god Dagon. Hey, dragon, dragon, not lizard. I don't do that tongue thing. Who Milton calls, say it with me, a demon in hell. Dagon, his name, sea monster, upward man and downward fish. He drew God's altar to disparage and displace, for one of Syrian mode, whereon to burn his odious offerings and adore the gods whom he had vanquished. Sanderson would not be the first to draw inspiration off Milton for a fishy, terrifying monster of ancient lore, as Lovecraft did so in his short story of Dagen an ill-fated tale of sailing where the sailor comes into contact with an eldritch horror. A fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of paradise lost, of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. Sanderson has admitted to being inspired by Lovecraft for naming the unmade, and I think that this wraps up this theory in a very nice bow. Number five, Wrath, Ray Shafir. For her, we're going to lean more into the visual cues that both Sanderson and Dante seem to be playing off of for their pit of wrath. The darkness seeped down the hallway. It wasn't fast, but there was inevitability about the way it coated everything flowing up the sides of the walls onto the ceiling. On the ground, shapes split from the main mass, becoming figures that sat as if from the surf. Creatures that had two feet and soon grew faces with clothing that rippled into existence. It's as if Reshafir embodies how Dante describes the general setting of the Circle of Wrath, a swamp full of souls who arise out of murky depths to do acts of unspeakable violence. They wallow here like pigs in slime, leaving behind foul memories of their crimes. The muddy sinners so dismember him. At this, the Florentine, gone wild with spleen, began to turn his teeth against himself. Reshafir's name may be inspired by the ancient Canaanite god Reshef, who is actually not listed specifically by Milton as a demon in hell, though Milton takes the time to say that all pagan deities are in fact demons in hell. He only has so much time and can cover only so many. He does, however, give particular attributes to the gods of Balim and Asortev. Uncompounded is their essence pure, like cumbrous flesh, but in what shape they choose, dilated or condensed, bright or obscure, can execute their airy purposes, and works of love or enmity fulfill. Given that the name Balim is related to the god of Baal, who, of course, inspired the name of Baal Zaman, father of lies, in The Wheel of Time, I find it very interesting that Reshafir's final chapter is called Mother of Lies, though in that chapter, it's actually Shalon who does the lying. Number six, heresy, Yelignon. A Sudan does give us this line before all hell breaks loose in Kolonar. Have you not seen my radiance? A Sudan asked. She grinned. The queen's guard. I've done what your father could not. She has a philosophy or a theology into which 
I would like to diligently inquire. You are accused of heresy on three counts. Heresy by thought, heresy by word, heresy by deed, and heresy by action. Four counts. Oh, Sanderson, Dean Sanderson, decries a Sudan's heresy by way of a ten-point thesis on the entryway. The reward for a Sudan and Amaram to profess their heresy to Odium is for him to give them Yelignar, who, in return, consumes their souls. Yelignar, called Blightwind, was one that could speak like a man, though often his voice was accompanied by the wails of those he consumed. Or at least the cognitive aspect of their soul. This is in line with the souls that Dante meets in the circle of heresy in the Inferno, who not only suffer from being set on fire, but also from the fact that they will get exactly what they believe in, that with the second coming and their rebirth, their soul will die with their body again. So you can understand how our awareness will die completely at the moment when the portal of the future has been shut. Brandon Sanderson has further confirmed that Yelignar's name does not come from a Mesopotamian deity, but rather from Lovecraft. But no one on the copper mine seems to know which one, and I, who have only dipped her toe in slightly for the sake of this video, have no clue. So, if you have any ideas, please let me know down in the comments. Number 7. Violence. Nergual. Okay, back to the strong, obvious connections. Nergaul was known for driving forces into battle rage, lending them great ferocity. Curiously, he did this to both sides of a conflict, Voidbringer and Human. Sanderson seems to focus on the third of the three subcategories of violence within Dante's seventh circle of hell, the circle about violence against one's neighbors. Dante reports the general vibe in the ring as being, Oh, blind cupidity and insane anger, which goad us on so much in our short life, and steep us in such grief eternally which sounds a lot like the general vibe reported by those who experience the thrill. Dante sees many tyrants in this bloody circle, such as Alexander the Great and Attila the Hun. The latter Sanderson has specifically stated as an inspiration for Dalinar. Number 8. Fraud. Saj Anat. There is such a fine line between the differences of fraud and treachery that these last two could go almost either way for me. However, I don't see Sajanat as being terribly treacherous because no one trusts her. Of the unmade, Sajanat was the most feared by the Radiance. They spoke extensively of how her ability to corrupt Spren, though only lesser Spren, whatever that means. Both knew she wanted more freedom than Odium would allow. Both knew that she wanted to be a god herself. But Odium didn't know for certain that she was taking actions to undermine him. Saj Anat is known for her acts of fraud and deception, which is why she has to spend so much time in Oathbringer insisting to Shallan that she is not her enemy. The lady doth protest too much, methinks. The clincher for me was that it's Saj Anat's influence that allows Renarin to see the future, a power of the void on Roshar, and from Dante's perspective, as it's the false prophets who are fraudsters who get a special type of torture in the Eighth Circle of Hell. Also getting their own special torture are seducers, which may explain why a Shirtmarn's lovely gluttonous revel may also have had other forms of debauchery going on on the perimeter. By your powers combined, you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. On the whole, Dante describes fraud as 
That which eats away at every conscience is practiced by a man against each other, who trusts in him, or who has no trust. The latter way seems only to cut off the bond of love that nature forges. So it makes sense that Sajanak, the fraud, is so dangerous to radiance as she can corrupt and sever the bonds which are so essential for forming night radiance. Number nine, treachery. Ba Edo Mishra. The deepest circle of hell is reserved for betrayers and mutineers. We know very little about Ba Edo Mishram, but since Rhythm of War, Rastari's Kalak has been giving us little insights, and he drops this gem in the prologue of Wind and Truth. I know where she is hidden, Rastari's whispered, where her soul is. Ba Edo Mishram grants her a fools, their other god. The one who could rival him. The one we betrayed. Perhaps Kalak is referring to Honor as the one they betrayed. I don't trust this kid any further than I can throw him. If it were not for Shalon ordering the book near the flame way back in the way of kings. This story is about a man going slowly insane as he watches his children starve. A story that is told to Dante by the traitor Agolini. I did not weep within. I turned to stone. They wept. My poor little Anselm said, Father, you look so... What is wrong with you? Father, it would be less painful for us if you ate of us. For you clothed us in this sad flesh. It is for you to strip it off. Oh, hard earth, why did you not open up? If this homage is intentional, it makes the title of the book, Near the Flame, somewhat funny, since Ugolini is reported by Dante to be currently frozen up to his uh, shoulders in ice in the deepest circle of hell. The night! Over. Looking at Dante's poetic language, I can see loads of parallels between Ba Edo Mishram and Ugolini's tales as they tell it. Both speak of being turned to stone. Both suffer as they watch their innocent children be stripped of the forms which they say, in Ugolini's case, they gave them. And both stories end with a cry for the earth to open as a testament to the tragedy. All are punished! Although Sanderson is not doing a one-to-one -one direct allegory, thankfully, otherwise I would be very bored, it's worth noting that Ugolini is frozen along with the man who locked him away, another traitor, Archbishop Ruggieri, who in the end betrayed both factions that he was fighting alongside in hopes that they would destroy each other, which sounds a lot like the game plan Ishar seems to have if only he were sane enough to pursue it. Wow! This video got a bit out of hand. Please let me know your thoughts down in the comments, like and subscribe if you want to see more, and see you next week. Thanks for watching, bye!